Um, so yeah, let's start. So this is what we saw on Monday, a little bit on uh, the growth in your traffic demand, um, the effect of COVID-19 in this um, uh, demand forecasts, uh, the growth in diversity in drones and our paths, also the challenges in regarding environmental issues like uh, the emissions and the effects of the climate change in aviation. And then we talk about the single European sky, um, which is like the ambition of Europe from the future of ATM. We saw what the high level goals were, um, the legislative package, and we finished over here with a uh, definition of these uh, functional airspace blocks. And uh, so, yeah, we started talking about uh, the project of CESAR, the Single European Sky ATM Research. And um, yeah, we talked about that we are now in the program CESAR 2020. We talked the th about the three uh, phases where definition, de uh, development, and deployment. And uh, we uh, we left it in here. So uh, we're going to see today to finish with um, Cesar is well not to finish because the following um, sessions we are going to be talking about Cesar uh, quite a bit as well. But uh, to uh, finish this sec section, um, so we're going to see what is the Cesar vision. What does Cesar wants to accomplish uh, as a project. So um, uh, Cesar defines um, his vision as to deliver a resilient and fully scalable ATM system capable of handling growing air traffic made up of diverse range of manned and unmanned air vehicles in a safe, secure, and sustainable manner. So basically they want to uh, integrate all traffic demand coming from a rise in the demand of uh, traditional air traffic and also the inclusion of these new airspace users. And to do so, they want to do it in a safe way, in a secure way, and also they want to take a look into the environment issues. So this is very ideal. Of course, everybody wants an ATM system that looks like this, but Cesar um, gives us um, some uh, solutions and some um, uh, research and development activities to actually accomplish these visions that they have. So these visions built primarily on the notion of trajectory-based operations. So the concept of trajectory-based operation is actually quite important in ITM, in the future of ITM. Um, it's basically the ideal for the uh, operational concept of air traffic. Basically, the, air, the airspace user will fly their preferred trajectories. This means that trajectories that are more efficient, that are less um, affecting the environment, and they are also most cost efficient. So all airspace users would want to fly their preferred trajectory independent of the airspace configuration, of the air traffic control, etc. So, um, in order to obtain this vision of a perfect ATM system, it is important to uh, build uh, this concept of trajectory based operations. So, in, in this vision, there's also a, a new architecture they defined, which is the digital European sky. Um, this is uh, a new concept that they introduced in the past years. So basically, in this uh, architecture, the result, the resources of the AGM, both in the ground and in the air, will be connected and optimized across the network, irrespective of the altitude. That means that uh, the resources will be provided to aircraft flying at very low altitude, up to uh, super high altitude operations. And it will also be independent of the class of airspace and the aircraft's performance. So the resources, the resources in this digital European sky will be automatically available to all the users in this um, in this system. And also, um, 
this new digital European sky will have uh, modern technology, which, is, um, which will be used uh, through a data rich and cyber secure connected digital ecosystem. So this sounds very, very well, everything, but um, let's see if uh, when they want to deliver this digital European sky. So um, this is our vision, tries to uh, improve every stage of the flight. So they uh, try to deliver these eight improvements, which are first enabling high network capacity and resilience. Uh, so we're gonna go for uh, each one of those and see what they mean by this. Uh, so there are eight uh, improvements. Um, basically, they will try to improve every stage of the flight. So in here, in this uh, figure over here, we see um, all the stages in the flight. First, the the planning and the pre departure when the aircraft is not has not yet uh, taken off. Um, so in this uh, part of the flight we will see a benefit uh, using, for example, the optimal use of ANS infrastructure, um, uh, well, all these uh, different improvements. So we see that if for each um, stage of the flight, we have an improvement that is going to uh, benefit the, air the aircraft trajectories and the aircraft flights in general. So um, let's see, let's go one by one, see what they mean by this improvement and see um, what the vision is. So first they talk about enabling a high network capacity and resilience. Uh, so that means that the airspace will be optimized according to uh, flows and no longer um, according to uh, uh, national uh, boundaries and such. And also, they're going to use cross fear cooperation. So this is a step towards this single European sky and this single block. Um, also, uh, this means that um, we are going to have uh, progressive levels of higher automation. We will have uh, service oriented architectures that will enable dynamic and shared management of airspace and remote provision of ATS. So basically, uh, the infrastructures will be able to, yeah, um, um, uh, limit the fragmentation and the rigidness of the airspace. So the airspace will be more flexible and dynamic, and also will be able to. Uh, the provision of services will be uh, shared across uh, the airspace and will not be. Uh, based on uh, local architectures. And also we will see a shift towards fly-centric operations. That means that instead of looking at one, um, uh, of one uh, flight in a single airspace sector on a, or in a piece of an airspace, we will be looking at the trajectory across a large portion of the airspace. And this will allow us to, um, of course, increase the efficiency in the provision of, AD, of air traffic systems and uh, of air traffic services, sorry, and to um, increase the efficiency of the trajectory. So instead of, I, I repeat, instead of looking at a single sector, for example, uh, we will be looking at a trajectory that goes along a big portion of the airspace. Uh, so the second improvement would be uh, to improve uh, flight trajectories. So this is basically based on trajectory-based operations. Um, anything related to trajectories of base operation will increase the efficiency of the trajectories. So uh, the uh, this concept will enable airspace users to operate their preferred trajectory from gate to gate. We will have um, um, a communication of the trajectory uh, through a um, through a concept which is the uh, system wide information management communication. So uh, in this concept, which is uh, you will see uh, if you get working with the team, you will see it a lot. It's basically a a communication system between all um, 
air uh, between all ATM stakeholders. That is a provision of information which is standardized and available to everyone. So if you want to know more about uh, the system-wide information management system, you can watch this video over here. I found it very, um, very illustrative and um, very useful. So if you have a time, if you have like 10 minutes, just please give it a look because I don't think, um, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's a, a, um, a very nice concept to know about. And it's also a, a very important in the future of ATM if you want to uh, deliver this vision. Um, so yeah, basically this TVO will mean increased predictability and fuel efficiency. Uh, uh, the third improvement would be uh, airport performance and access. So basically better airports in general, we will have new approach procedures, the use of remote tower services that right now we are using at uh, tra uh, air airports with low traffic, but uh, the objective is that it will be extend the two million traffic airports as well. Um, also a better performance in the airports uh, that will be possible to uh, big data analytics and artificial intelligence and um, improvements in the safety uh, using support tools and alert system for traffic controllers and also onboard enhanced vision system for pilots accessing these airports. An additional improvement would be enable greater airborne automation. And this is particularly uh, important for the integration of uh, drones uh, in the use space. And this uh, increasing in airborne air automation will uh, allow greater levels of autonomy and connectivity, and also will allow different um, um, different kind of operations, like for example, single pilot operations. That it, I, I'm sure you know this, but uh, airport, um, um, commercial flights have two pilots, a pilot and a gold pilot. Um, and so being able to fly a commercial um, plane with one single air uh, pilot would mean that you will have to have a completely autonomous uh, a virtual co-pilot, so to say, so the operation does not decrease in its level of safety. And also the next step in single pilot operations will be to have a fully autonomous flight. Uh, personally, I think that it, that is too far away for commercial, commercial uh, uh, flights, but uh, for smaller flights, like um, in general aviation, for example, I don't think it's too, uh, too weird of a possibility, but let's see. Um, so yeah, and finally, the another, the another benefit of increasing the automation will be the um, the, uh, the integration of both uh, both uh, manned and unmanned air vehicles. Uh, next, we have the improvement of ANS productivity. So basically. Um, this uh, productivity of our navigation services will improve uh, things uh, to a uh, first increase levels of in automation support for traffic controllers or so traffic controllers uh, will perform fewer manual tasks and also this will decrease their workload so they will be more efficient we will move from voice to data communication and also we will have better connectivity and information sharing between ground systems and uh, this is very important if we want to meet the uh, growing demand. Um, the other improvement would be the unoptimal use of ANS infrastructure, uh, for example, through standardization and virtualization of the services. So uh, this uh, is also related to the uh, use of remote centers for um, air traffic control in TMAs and in route and the use of remote towers um, in airports. So um, these two concepts will allow the ANS to be uh, more, um, yeah, more flexible and of course uh, more uh, efficient. 
then we have increased global in interoperability and collaboration. So uh, again, through SWIM, we will have a better collaborative decision making and we will have a standards for the information exchange so that all the stakeholders in the ATN system can communicate efficiently and make decisions together. And this uh, also a, a nice uh, addition in this uh, improvement would be the big data management. So through um, the, uh, the ATM system delivers a lot of data from single flights, for air traffic services, for ANSPs, and using all of this data uh, to be able to give us a better information and to uh, help stakeholders to um, do better schedules and do um, and, and do a better uh, planning processing would also be um, a, a concept in the future of ATM that I think it's I think this is this particular um, this particular thing we have not so far away because we are seeing that right now that uh, big data management and data analytics is a big topic in general in our society nowadays, especially you know for internet related things. So a lot of advantage advantages have been done, and I don't think this is uh, too far for being implemented into ATN system. Actually, Aero Control has a lot of projects related to big data management and such, especially for trajectory prediction and that kind of thing. Um, and last, we have enhanced safety and security. So all of this past will have to be done uh, meeting safety, stand safety standards because safety is the more, most important thing in aviation, basically. So this Improvements in automation will support higher levels of safety. Also, more safety nets, safety nets will be in, um, will be enhanced in uh, both airports and airborne uh, flights. And finally, we will have a better collaborative process between civil and military stakeholders. So this is what Cesar wants in general about the future of ATM how they vision how they envision this european atn system to be um of course it's very ambitious this is not something that we're gonna uh, achieve in five years or so it's something that it will take a lot of um it will take some decades but all the steps are going towards this direction and of course this vision is of today uh, 10 years ago or five years ago, people were not even thinking about drones because they were not such a, uh, they, they didn't know that there were going to be so many business opportunities for drones and air fires in the ATM. So um, with, the, with the coming years, we will have new technologies and new business opportunities that we will have to integrate in this vision. So that's why the uh, European ATM master plan is constantly constantly updating because they want to take into account all these new developments. So if you look at the European ATM master plan for 2009, um, the vision and the performance ambitions were so very different as they are of today. I mean, the concept in general is the same. They want a very efficiency, more capacity, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, these all new technologies, these um, emphasis on digitalization that's that's kind of new um so this yeah expect that this will change in the future so this is not like the final this is not exactly what the future of atm could be but as of today that 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 this is the best that we can aspire to okay so let's talk about this is our faces so in order to deliver this vision Cesar has proposed four, phase, four phases, which are uh, phase A, phase B, phase C, and phase D. So these are four phases. We um, uh, reflect the uh, steps towards this uh, digital um, European sky. So uh, in the phase A, we will address uh, non-critical network performance deficiency. So what are the problems of today? In phase B, 
um, we have efficient services and infrastructure delivery. So we start um, implementing those research and development um, uh, solutions. Then in phase C, they envision that we will have a defragmentation of European sky through virtualization. So at this point in the future, the um, uh, Earth space in Europe will no longer be fragmentized and we will have different um, remote centers and uh, virtual centers to uh, um, provide uh, air navigation services to the whole system. And finally, the phase D is the target vision, is the future in the long term. So this is the whole vision of the digital European sky. So basically, through going through these phases, the uh, system will move from a country specific architecture to an, an interoperable global and flexible provision of uh, service provision infrastructure. So we're going through a country based ATM to a global ATM. Uh, so these phases overlap and the, the first three ones are already being deployed or in the pipeline towards deployment. So th this is not something that is it's something in the future, like a vague promise. It's something that uh, in Europe, some projects have, has, are already working on. Uh, so let's uh, see um, these different phases, uh, what they mean. So in phase I, we have a we have to address non-critical network performance and efficiency. Um, so uh, right now, this is uh, this is where we are today in phase A. Um, well, um, more or less over here. So uh, in, in between between A phase A and phase B. So in phase A, most air navigation service provider providers are vertically integrated into a country-based infrastructure that was that was we have today. ANSP belong to a given country. So um, yeah, in this figure over here, we see the countries represented as vertical columns. Um, so we can see that the services are either, either in one country or other country, but never shared. Um, the network manager operates uh, over all these countries and the airports um, belong, of course, to either one of, uh, yeah, they belong to these countries that are separated, they are not integrated in the network. Um, but there's some kind of uh, interaction between ATC, like for all the cross operational activities and such. But um, what we see in this phase is an initial option of a service oriented architecture. So these are, we are taking the, these initial steps to um, see this service-oriented architecture because um, the, traditionally we have a technology-oriented architecture. This means that uh, you have this, we have this technology, we have these, uh, these services, and you have to work with that. So that's, that's kind of what we have today. Uh, we have several infrastructure that do certain things, certain things and um flights uh, work with that um infrastructure but what we want to do what, what we want to achieve in the future is to say okay i want this service and somehow somebody will provide it to you a navigation service provider or a, a communications nav navigation and, um, and surveillance uh, installation but in general we we go from I have this technology and I, you, I will use it the best I can to, I want to do this and I need this service to do this. So uh, the air navigation service providers will be able to provide uh, those services based on the performance and based on the necessity of the, um, uh, of the ATM stakeholders. Uh, so in this phase, we also see uh, the implementation of SWIM. Again, please give it a look at that video. It's very informative, but um, I, I repeat, SWIM is like a, a communication sharing um, um, system 
which is a standardized and where the information is available to everyone. And this is <clears throat> this is quite important because traditionally, uh, an, an air navigation service provider we have or a country <clears throat> will have a technology and and we'll have communications that are local. So being able to have a standard to everybody in the community, in the ATM community, allows that um, interoperability between um, between players. And this interoperability, it what it, it's what makes the global um, airspace more efficient. And this phase has already started and. We have some uh, development uh, solutions that has already been delivered. Then we have phase B. Uh, so um, also in this year over here, we do see that the performance increases as we go up in the in the phases. But that's something that uh, you already uh, catch up on, I guess. Um, so in phase B, we have efficient uh, efficient services and infrastructure delivery. So. Um, in this phase, we will have a common service layers available, achievable through a set of uh, airspace data service providers. Uh, so you can see in here that the services and infrastructure are no longer tied to countries, but are shared between them. That's something important uh, to, to have a more efficient uh, service and more efficient infrastructure and not being uh, um, constricted by uh, local boundaries and local regulations, but being able to provide those services uh, to a whole uh, through, uh, through fears and through countries. We see more cooperation between uh, ATC and operation and again, we uh, and, and we start to see how airports are more connected between each other through information sharing, and also connected with the network management, with the network manager. Uh, so we will have um, the move from physical infrastructure to virtual infrastructure, and increase in automation. We will enable remote provision of ATS. Again, this uh, the the the, the um, one important thing to have services across different countries is is practically this virtualization uh, because if we are considering local architectures that um, are analogic, as to say, like for example, a vegan that has a given range, of course, that's not that cannot possibly go through boundaries and through countries because it physically cannot reach more than its uh, capacity. But if we have a virtual uh, data, um, a virtual data center or a virtual uh, or a airspace um, digital service provider, we will have these services available in every place that we go in the airspace. So that's one change that uh, will be important to deliver this phase. And um, also in, in phase B, we will see to, uh, we will start to see more our uh, more airspace users like drone operations, high, very high altitude operators, and use space service providers. Then we have uh, phase C, which is titled the, the fragmentation of the European sky through virtualization. So in here we will have level into, uh, automation, uh, get the levels of automation and connectivity. The flight will be managed and optimized as a whole. As a whole, we will have an integration between ATC and APFCM, which is uh, quite important, I think. So in here, uh, we can see that the lines between uh, the different countries are a little blurry. So that means that the ATC is not. Um, is not um, uh, tied to those national boundaries in the countries. So ANSPs in the respective all the national borders will be able to plug in their services when they are needed, providing end-to-end -end services, sharing resources among ANSPs. Um, and also in this phase, we will have um, drone operations uh, that will be uh, routing operations. 
even if they are not fully integrated into the ATM. And finally, phase D would be the, the ideal vision. Um, the, oui, sorry. the ATM and aviation will evolve into an integrated digital ecosystem characterized by distributed data services, a full scalable system, and um, yeah, the, the delivery of this digital European sky, uh, we has been set a date to, to, uh, to 2014, and it's very ambitious. And this will, if we want to implement this digital European sky as of that date, it, it will require changes to the regulatory framework and shorten innovation cycles and time to market. Um, I don't know what you think, yeah, if, if this will be possible in 20 years. For me, it's very ambitious, but some people may not be that uh, pessimistic. Um, but yeah, let's see what the future brings. Uh, so this is basically what I told you already, a little summary of the different um, phases. We see how the level, levels of automation increase. Uh, through the phases. And this is a, a picture of the different levels of automations and how the different phases of the of Cesar will um, work with this automation. So um, I don't know if you are familiar with the scale of automation, but uh, it goes from zero to five, um, uh, depending on whether the human does most of the task to the automation, uh, so the, to there's no human operator. So basically, uh, with each step, we are giving um, the, the human is doing less and less task and, until we have a fully automated system. Um, so uh, we see that in, in phase A, we will have very little automation. In phase B, um, so we have to differentiate between air traffic control and e space services because, of course, e space services will have a higher levels of automation. So we see that uh, B and C, uh, we have levels one or two of automation. So up to level two, the action uh, is only initiated by human. So this is what we have in phases B and C. And we see that it, we are very, um, res, um, how is the word? Um, uh, we are not very happy with giving automation to to higher levels for ATC because we don't um, uh, we don't trust automation that much. I was, that much I would say, and also because um, having a human do the task is the um right now it's more safe than giving up to a machine because of course the the technology is not yet there for meeting those levels of safety but in phase d we will have uh, more levels on automation but never reaching the level five which is no human operator so uh, even in the most uh, futuristic state of ATM that Cesar can envision, that there will not be a fully automated ATC uh, service. But that's not the case with uh, use services. Uh, so use services, we will have very high levels of automation, all um, where our actions can be initiated uh, completely without the intervention of humans and up to no intervention at all in the last phase. So yeah, um, after this class, let's give it a look at, at this um, summary over here. I think uh, it's, this is not only, this is, so this scale is not only a, um, applicable to aviation, um, it's applicable to um, any kind of operation that you may think that will require automation. So it's, uh, it's quite nice to read. Okay, so we have, um, we have seen the uh, the single European sky. We have seen what the vision is and what the phases to deliver this mission are. So now we are going to take a look to the performance ambitions. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Okay, I know it's a lot, but um, 
I mean, ATM is a lot. <laughs> okay, so let's go with the performance and vision of the So in 2009, with a targeting date of 2020, so last year, these were the ambitions of Cesar. They, they wanted to have a 23% increase in capacity uh, uh, in comparison with 2004. Um, with um, the accidents and risk will not increase despite air traffic growth. They will also want to have a 10% reduction uh, per flight in environmental impact compared to 2005, and a 50% reduction, of course, per flight compared to 2004. So this made, these ambitions were not met uh, by last year, but they have been revisited since then. So with each with each edition of the European Master Plan, new ambitions were set, taking into account new traffic, uh, new uh, air traffic demand data and new technologies. So the ambitions that they have right now have a target of 2035, and they are comparing it to data from 2012. Uh, so uh, the performance ambitions are categorized in six KPAs, in six key performance areas. So you remember that last week we talked about ICAO uh, key performance areas. Um, we have a list of 11 of them. Uh, so uh, Cesar um, has its own key performance areas, but they are included, I think, in the ICAO ones, and they have uh, capacity, cost efficiency, operational efficiency, environment, safety, and security. Let's go a little bit over one of them. So capacity, basically, they want to uh, um, take tackle the capacity crunch and address the risk of accommod unaccommodated traffic and increase the good traffic, uh, traffic uh, throughput. Um, basically, they want to accommodate the demand. In the cost efficiency, um, the ambition is to provide technical system changes uh, that reduce the, the cost of the services. Um, so, uh, in general, um, so they want to enhance the overall productivity of ANS provision. So, the, each flight costs less, both because of the operations in the flights and both because of the um, provision of air navigation systems. Then we have operational efficiency, uh, which is um, um, a decrease in the uh, price in the cost of a single flight through the reduction and their management of departure delays and efficient flight plans. And this will reduce the fuel consumption as well and increase the predictability. Then we have the environment when the where the ambition is to achieve a reduction in the gate-to-gate -gate, uh, CO2 emissions. And this one, um, these two over here are very related because if we have a better operational efficiency, we will have better, uh, less um, emissions uh, due to inefficiencies in the operations. Then we have safety. So the ambition is to have zero accidents as a consequence of ATM and ANS. And finally, the security, which means that the ATM should be protected against security threats. Um, so these are the performance ambitions of Cesar. Uh, they are, I, as I said, uh, classified in these six uh, key performance areas. In here we see the Cesar, the single European sky, sorry, high level goals. Uh, these goals were set in 2005 with the, uh, uh, when first the, the Cesar sorry, the single European sky was envisioned. It was to increase the capacity th for three, reduce the cost of ATM services by half, enable a 10% reduction in the effects of flights over the environment and improve the safety by a factor of 10. So this is what um, the idea of says uh, was defined in 2005. And this is the key performance indicators that Hexar has, has used to measure these key, this, this key performance areas. So for example, let's go through the capacity. So they measure 
the capacity uh, with one key performance indicator, which, are, which is the departure delay. So um, this is the average value. So the baseline value in 2012 was 9.5 minutes. And they want to decrease this, to this, decrease this value in 2035 to uh, a number between 6.5 and 8.5 minutes. So this would mean uh, an absolute improvement on 10 minutes and a relative improvement on 10 to 30 percent. Um, so they have all these ambitions. Um, of course, they want to um, increase the number of AFR movements, uh, which means uh, at, at five to ten percent uh, increase in these um, AFR movements. Um, the net, the flight through the network or the flight um, in flight hours through the network in here as well. Um, we can see that these numbers increase a lot. In case of cost efficiency, uh, it is measured with the key performance indicator of gate to gate uh, direct ANS cost per flight, or, or how much does the ANS service cost per flight. So they try to drop it from uh, 960 to uh, around 600 with a, a relative improvement of a 40 percent, 30 to 40 percent. The operational efficiency, um, they want to decrease the gate to gate full burn per flight uh, at five to 10 percent. And we can see how this is directly related to uh, the reduction in gate to gate CO2 emissions because they are the same values. They want to reduce both the, flu the, uh, the fuel used and the emissions uh, from five to five percent and yeah they want to completely eliminate ATM related accidents and uh, they want to achieve a security um, a security level where there are no significant disruption due to cyber security vulnerabilities so these are the ambitions for 2035 we will see by then if they have been met. Um, but yeah, this is what the solutions are are there for. Um, so in, in the uh, this, I, I must say that this performance ambitions has been uh, computed by CSR using a, a data uh, based approach. These are not just numbers thrown and say, okay, this would be nice. They had this number has actually been computed using the forecast for traffic demand, the forecast for the provision of different solutions and technologies. So basically, if everything we see in the ATM master plan is uh, goes according to plan, we will be able to achieve this performance ambitions. And now we are going to see something which is the single European airspace system, which is the future of the airspace in Europe. So uh, this is the single European airspace system is based on something that was developed by Cesar Joint Undertaking, which is uh, this over here, a proposal for the future architecture of the European airspace. Uh, it, uh, it was developed by Cesar Joint Undertaking uh, with the support of uh, Eurocontrol and it was delivered to the European Commission in uh, February of 2019. So this proposal um, uh, aims to address the airspace capacity challenge combining uh, airspace configuration and design and technologies to decouple the service provision from local infrastructure. So this is a proposal for how houses are once the future of the airspace system to be in Europe. So this is the current architecture. We have a physical layer where the we have different countries that are separated and have infrastructure that are fragmented. Um, we have an air traffic, uh, traffic service layer, layer um, uh, with has, which has a vertical integration of 
uh, application and information. So what we have in a country, the uh, the air traffic services will have information about that and the airspace flying over that country, over that airspace will have um, air traffic services delivered in a vertical way. We have low levels of information sharing, limited automation, and in general, we have limited, limited capacity per scalability, etc. So this current architecture is the result of historical operational technical evolution conducted at a national level. This, is, this has led to the airspace to be fragmented, which, which we know now, uh, this is not efficient. Um, so in this fragmented system, each area control center is a node in a global network, which some of them are already um, operating uh, very close to maximum capacity. Resources, um, including data and their ability to deliver service, are not connected across the network, across those nodes. So the services that and the data that one air, air, area control center has is not shared between area control centers. So this, this means that if one node has a problem, this problem will spread across the network. And when an airspace user counter delays, this um, new, uh, new, newly formed delays from one flight can easily propagate to a second flight and a third flight. And these kind of delays that are going to propagate through the network can be absorbed by buffers, but not all of them. And also the existence of buffers in the schedule is necessary. So this, this is a very fragmented structure, which is not efficient. And this is what we currently have nowadays. Uh, so in the current architecture, we have some factors that are limit, limiting the overall capacity. For example, a non-optimal organization of airspace. Airspace is not organized depending on flow or depending on operational necessities. It is organized mostly because of national borders. We have a limited use of data communications, limited opportunity to create new sectors and limited automation support for controllers. So this is limit, limiting capacity. And there are some factors that are limiting cap, uh, scalability and resilience. Uh, just so to remember, scalability is the ability of the airspace to accommodate more and more flights. So in order to accommodate the increase in demand and the resilience of the air, of the um, capacity is the ability of recover from a uh, from a disturbance. So for example, those delays that propagate means that there is very little resilience in a system with a lot of resilience. If one delay takes place because of a given disruption, this will this will um, the the system will recover very quickly and this delays will not propagate as much. So the factors that are limiting the capacity, scalability and resistance are that we have limited predictability, again, limited information sharing, limited flexibility in the use of controller resources across different area control centers. So one single controller is responsible for its sectors, but it cannot operate in different sectors. And also, of course, the hierarchical constraints on ATS provision. So what are we going forward in the future? So this is the future architecture that they envision. We have the infrastructure, which is shared between the estates. Of course, it has a national, it has a given location, but the infrastructure is integrated and rationalized in the ATM structure. And also, in comparison with the other one, we saw that we have a vertical integration. So each one of these services gives a service to a given <clears throat> air traffic service provider. So the infrastructure is connected vertically. In here, we have a, a share information that goes to data centers. And from these data centers, the, the, uh, the resources and the data is um, provided to air traffic services and also to air space operations. 
So we no longer have this vertical dependency, but we have um, uh, an infrastructure that is giving information to the whole a to the whole airspace. We have higher levels of automation support and virtualization, which means that we have a scalable capacity. And then we have the airspace that which is, which is no longer again vertical, but we have um, pr uh, services that are provided along uh, the whole airspace and not limited to um, the stairs uh, uh, boundaries. So for example, this gray line over here uh, represents the um, the um, bond uh, the borders between state A and state B. But we can see that the the con the 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 ACC sectors go through these um, national borders. And also, we have new players, which are, for example, higher airspace operations of uh, the use of airpass and drones flying alongside um, uh, no, uh, traditional air traffic and also the presence of um, drones in the lower airspace. So this is the future architecture that they propose. In this future architecture, um, we have the notion of single European airspace system, uh, SEA is the resources are connected and optimized across the network uh, which has uh, modern technology um, with threat data rich and cyber secure connected ecosystem um, yeah in in contrast to having um airspace and cyber production uh, according to uh, national borders we have this um, service provision has been optimized according to traffic patterns. And we, this new airspace system will accommodate new forms of traffic. So these are the solutions that will allow the implementation of this future architecture um, for the solutions that will improve the capacity overall. We have an optimized airspace organization operational harmonization and automation and productivity tools. And the solutions that will allow increase in scalability and resilience are the virtualization and ATM, and ATM data as services. So we transition from, uh, from um, location-based uh, centers to virtual centers and common data layers. So we, not have, we no longer have that vertical um, association between infrastructure and air, and air traffic services. Then we have um, the dynamic management of airspace. So we, the airspace will be um, managed according to the necessities of the airspace users uh, through dynamic grouping and the grouping of sectors. We will have flight centric operations. So this changes the responsibility of one controller, which traditionally one controller is, is uh, in charge of a single, a single sector. So now through these flight centric operations, one controller will be responsible for the whole flight or the, of the aircraft across a, a bigger section of the airspace. And also, one important thing would be um, the that ATS operation could be sector independent. This means that right now, air traffic controllers are trained and are certified for a given sector, and they cannot uh, provide their um, their services to another sector because they are not prepared for that. They don't have the expertise to, to that. But shifting to a performance-based uh, system, ATCs would be able to uh, provide their services across multiple set, uh, sectors. So the configuration of the sector will not be no longer important, but the performance of the operations within that sector, every air traffic controller would be able to provide their service across multiple sectors. And finally, we have enhancements in communication, navigation, and surveillance systems. Um, so they envision a transition a strategy of, uh, with increments of uh, five years. So in 2000, at the end of 2025, these milestones should be achieved. 
like the implementation of free route, air, air ground and ground ground connectivity, um, yeah, different solutions that they envision. In 2030, so in 10 years, we will see these uh, solutions implemented, like for example, capacity on demand or higher levels on automation in support, uh, support devices or solutions, implement of virtual centers. And finally, the vision should be fully implemented um, in 15 years um, with a transformation to flight and flow centric operation, trajectory based operation, and service orienting and traffic management. So, yeah, they, they envision that by 2035, they will have this single European airspace system delivered. Okay, so let's continue with CESAR essential operational changes. So what is an essential operational change? An essential operational change is a game changer that is triggering a structural evolution in the European ATM. They are required to deliver CESAR vision. Basically, they are big changes that are going to take place in ATM to deliver this future digital European sky. They are not independent from each other and they are the following. They have considered nine, but through the different set, the, through the different editions of the ATM master plan, they identify different essential operational changes. So these are the one for the edition of 2020. So they have changes in communication, navigation, and surveillance infrastructure and services, US space services, a fully dynamic and optimized airspace, an interconnected network, the virtualization of service provision, trajectory based operations, digital, um, uh, as, um, I'm sorry, the A is for aeronautic, aeronautic information management and meteorological systems services, um, the, the improvement of airport and TMA performance, and something that they call multimodal mobility and integration of all space users. First, before we go through every one of them, we're going to talk about CSR solutions. So what are CSR solutions? CSR solutions are new or improved operational procedures or technologies that are designed to meet the essential operational changes. So they are, uh, are um, self-standing packages that aim to contribute to the modernization and high performance on the European ATM. These solutions usually take the form of a project that is, is carried out by an organization, a university, a, 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 a company, and they are, they are um, collected in this CSR solution catalog. So in this catalog are all the solutions that has either have been implemented or are being implemented or they are ongoing projects. So these are the, these little pieces that will eventually construct the, uh, the, the future of the ATM. These CSR solutions are grouped into four key features, which are optimized ATM network services, advanced air traffic systems, high-performing airport operations and enabling aviation infrastructure. So let's see a little bit what they mean by these uh, four key features. So in high-performing airport operation, in, this includes uh, airport management, remote towers, uh, runway throughput capabilities, etc. Everything that's improving the operation of airports. Then we have advanced air traffic services. This includes um, time-based separation, a better sequencing of traffic, automation support tools. Then we have optimized network operations. This includes dynamic collaborative tool to manage ATC air, air traffic configuration, uh, civil and military collaboration, everything related to air traffic flow management. And then we have enabling infrastructure, which are um, in this, uh, we include, for example, uh, this uh, communication, navigation, and surveillance integration to facilitate economies of scale. And um, one important thing is that the 
the presence of SWIM, the system wide information management government, uh, the architectural and technology solutions, etc. So all related to infrastructure and data. So let's go back to the essential operational changes. They are this nine over here. Let's go, uh, let's go through them. Um, so then we have uh, uh, CNS infrastructure and services. So historically, we have national ownership of the infrastructure. And this um, also they have the need to support a variety of heterogeneously equipped airspace users. So each each aircraft will not have the same um, the same avionics or the same um, communications procedures. So this is an efficient uh, distribution in general of the equipment. The ideally we will have an infrastructure and airspace users that will use the same communication procedures and the same information. So the main challenge is to optimize the infrastructure and uh, use it efficiently, both in the ground and in the air. And these changes will be driven by a service-based approach and a performance-based approach, as opposed to a technology-based approach. Um, so we talked about this earlier today, but the, the shift would be from a technology-based approach where the technology is given and we want to make the most of it to a system when you define your, your performance, you define your ambitions and the, um, the infrastructure will be uh, enough to give you the services that you need. This means that uh, they're going to be service-based. Um, in this uh, approach, the um, communication navigation and surveillance services provider and um, air navigation services provider may be different entities. So as of today, normally air navigation service providers are responsible for implementing the infrastructure and maintaining them. So in this future system, uh, the air navigation service provider will be consumers of the CNS services then this also will allow the decoupling of uh, CNS services from air traffic services and air traffic management data services. And in general, this will make the system more flexible, resilient, etc. Then we have the ATM interconnected network. Uh, so traditionally, and as of today, um, we have a wide variety of applications developed over time for specific purposes and these interfaces between these applications are custom designed um, so they are um, they are managed locally this means that they are not um, constructed to function as a element of a network we have this solution we have this technology and you just have to make the use of it so there is a strong case for standardization in the of the ATN sister interfaces. So, what uh, the essential the essential operational change um, could be to have a ATM collaborative network, which will allow all the all the users, all the stakeholders, to participate in a collaborative decision uh, making process in a network that is transparent and they will negotiate their preference and reach agreements. Um, and this interconnected network uh, will allow to um, have a real-time visualization of the evolving network. And also one important part of this uh, essential operational change is the integration of air traffic flow and capacity management and air traffic control uh, flying functions. This means that the operations of the network um, and the operation of air traffic services will be a lot of um, interrelated um, because the function, uh, the, um, uh, the network as a whole will be um, 
will be managed in a collaborative process. So the lines that differentiate ATC and air traffic flow and capacity management uh, will blur a little bit. So we will have, ideally, we will not have an ATM system that it's uh, that is um, uh, that is um, segregated. I mean, we won't have that branch structure that we saw last week. We will have a whole um, provision of services. Then we have digital um, aeronautic information management and meteorological services. Basically, they want the information to be available and share at all times, also, also through digitalization. Then we have US-based services. Um, uh, this is basically the need for integrating uh, drone traffic management system and different aerospace users and enable, enable simultaneous drone operations. Um, so basically, uh, in the end, um, use space services will rely on high levels of digitalization and automation, and uh, all these new airspace users will be in will be uh, integrated into the uh, air traffic management system in a safe way, in an efficient way, etc. Uh, so the use space is the yeah, the, the framework that is enabling the inclusion of these new airspace, um, airspace users in the, in the APM network. Then we have the virtualization of service prov provisions. We talk a lot about this, I think. Uh, when, uh, we talk about this uh, in the airspace, uh, when we talk about the airspace, but we will see it again as an essential operational change. So a traditional, Traditionally, um, the provision of air navigation services is based on local implementation of the necessary capabilities, and this is uh, a fra this results in, a, in results in a fragmented uh, situation. So, um, by using um, digitalization. Um, the physical processing capabilities will no longer need to be close to the point of view. So an airspace user that is flying kilometers away from an infrastructure with, through virtualization will be able to access the services and data from that infrastructure. And this will, of course, um, provide the ability of uh, performing air traffic services from a remote location in this essential operational changes. We have the remote tower concept in the airports. And also uh, in uh, um, outside airports in the terminal maneuvering area or en route, uh, we have something that's called virtual centers. Uh, so this will be the equivalent in the airports, but for the, um, for the ACC. So these um, virtual centers will allow the geographical sector to be managed from any place. So instead of having an ACC in a, a, in a given geographical location, the services provided by, uh, by an ACC will be, um, could be uh, provided anywhere independent of the location of that, of that sector. Um, so this is, as, as you know, this has already been implemented in some places. This is a little further in the future. But in general, the, the more the, the services and the more the data is being virtualized, the closer we are to this remote um, provision of services. Then we have airport and terminal maneuvering area uh, performance. So nowadays, airport uh, operations and airspace users operation are significant contributor to uh, delays due to capacity issues and weather conditions. So this uh, essential operational change covers um, changes to airports and terminal maneuvering area that allow the maintenance of the operational capacity 
under limiting conditions. This means that under these trails or under um, giving events that are disrupting the operational capacity should be maintained and also covers changes that allow an increase in the operational capacity. Uh, this includes improvement in the planning and execution of operation, both in airports and around airports. We have them fully dynamic and optimized air pace. This, this is basically what we talked about in the previous section, the implementation of a, a, new, um, a future airspace that will be fully flexible, a step towards a trajectory-based operation and free routes. And one thing that I think it's a nice concept is uh, what I mentioned earlier, but uh, the main chain is to move from um, airspace management collaborative process into a fully integrated airspace management, air traffic control, and air traffic flow and capacity management through a collaborative decision-making layer process. So in the end, they want these three um, big ATM uh, services to be uh, fully integrated in order to give a better um, a better service in the end. Then we have the concept of trajectory-based operation that we talk about this uh, when we saw the vision of SESAR. The trajectory-based operation uh, will enable airspace users to fly their perfect trajectory in constraints what do we have what we have today, which is um, uh, that the national provider is maintaining its own virtual data on the flight. So in in the concept of trajectory based operation operations, a trajectory will be created and agreed for its flight representing the business needs of the airspace user. And uh, these reference trajectories um, that the airspace user agreed to fly, the, uh, the air navigation service providers and the airports will be we agreed to facilitate um, this trajectory. Uh, so the users will be able to fly the preferred trajectories, which will, of course, will deliver uh, more efficient and more um, a more um, yeah, a more cost efficient um, flight as well. And lastly, we have the multimodal mobility and integration of all airspace users. This one is a little bit weird. Um, this is not something that I that um, you would normally think of when you think of ATM. But it means um, that uh, with this concept and this change, they want to integrate different modes of transportation to deliver a door-to-door -door service. So the passengers will not need to worry about selecting the most appropriate means of traveling and various modes of transport like car, train, helicopter, for example, will be seamlessly combined. Um, so in the future, we will, when we think of travel, we will think I'm going to point A and point B and all the services that we encounter along the way will be perfectly synchronized and everything will be great. So what this means regarding air traffic management is that air traffic management must be flexible enough to accommodate this new development. And, and that's, that's it for the uh, essential operational ch changes. And let's continue with the deployment of SSR solutions. Um, so uh, SSR solutions fall within three categories. First, we have solutions that are delivered. The CR solution has been successfully rolled out from research and development and has demonstrated benefits, so they are transferred to deployment. These are mature solutions. Uh, they are, these solutions uh, are included in phases E and B of the of the of CSR. Then we have solutions that are in development, so they are under development and are expected to reach readiness for industrialization within the life of CSR 2020. These are 
solutions that will be developed during phase B and phase C. And, also, and then we have the last category, which will be estimated future research and, and development, uh, which um, are solutions that are needed to achieve the digital European sky that are needed for phase B, but they are currently being further explored. They are not as mature as the other ones. Uh, if you go listening over here, you will see a list of um, CESAR solutions and what is the state of development. So please, if you want to give it a look, that could be, um, it, it's, an inter it's a very ni uh, nice uh, web page. And also you can see that it's not only an idea, it's not only, the, it's not only good intentions, they are already in, the, in deployment and that, yeah, solutions uh, bring benefit to the ATM. So in the status of the solutions, we see that the delivered in the, in the, whole, um, the, in the whole catalog of CSR solutions, around more than one third have already been delivered. I'm sorry. Uh, a little less than one third are in development. 32% um, are estimated future research and development. And of this 37% uh, that has been delivered, 70% are with deployment decision. This means that a decision has been made in order to deploy this, and they are part of the um, European Master Plan Level 3. So this, um, the Master Plan has different levels. Um, the first one is the executive level. Uh, the second one, I, I think it's the base. I, I don't remember the name of the second level. And the third level is the deployment uh, level. Um, so in here, they have the deployment um, uh, plan for CSR solutions. Um, and as I said, 70% of those deliver uh, solutions uh, have a deployment decision, but 30% of them don't. And of those 70%, um, uh, Forty-eight percent are regulated, which means are part of the pilot common project, which we will talk in a minute. And fifty-two percent are not part of this of this project. Uh, so, what is the pilot common project? So, the, this was a, a pilot initiative to deploy SSR solutions in a coordinated and synchronized uh, manner. It was part of a European legislation, which is this one in 2014. And the target date to deliver these solutions were between 2021 and 2025. And we see that 71.8 of the solutions inside PCP has been delivered. And now we have another legislation that, uh, so this is finishing uh, very soon. So the new legislation with a target of 2027 is the common project one. And well, these two common projects and the, uh, the regulations are basically, um, they, they want to provide funding to these solutions and these projects to deliver uh, CSR solutions. Um, so the, these are the milestones of the development of CSR. Uh, as they envision in their master plan. So we have phases A, B, C, and D. So let's just start with A. Phase A should end in 2025. So these little uh, symbols mean the start of deployment, the, the uh, yellow triangle. The rumbles means full, full operational capability. And the, the, the blue triangle is a research and development readiness. So the phase A started years ago and has, uh, we will finish, uh, they will, it will be finished by 2025, that is in four years. Phase B should be finished by 2030, around in 10 years. 
phase C should be finished by 2035. Remember that this date was the same as the development, as the deliver, uh, as the development of the airspace uh, new architecture. So by 2035, uh, we should have the defragmentation of the European skies. And then we have phase D, which they envision two options. One, all the research and development and all the solution of CESAR are, in, are done efficiently and fast. So this means that the phase D will be achieved by 2040, so in 30 years. But if that's not the case, and um, they have some difficulties implementing the solutions and the scenarios, we will have a, uh, a phase D that will be achieved in 2050 or later. And of course, the e-space de deployment will be a grad gradual over the following years. Then, for the drone operation, the deployment vision is the following. For uh, remote pilot aircraft, uh, we will have that uh, for in, in airspace of classes A and C. So you remember the classification of airspaces, right? Uh, from A being the more control, controlled to G being the less controlled. So we will have phases air pass one, two, and three. The first one should have been already implemented when um, I think that it has. And the phase, the last phase, which is the integration of um, AirPass with uh, instrumental and visual flight rules, will be um, developed in uh, uh, 2013. And for the U space, we have four phases starting the foundational service uh, that was um, a couple of years ago to full services in 2035. And last, I, got, I want to give you an example of what a timeline for CSR look like. So if you go to the European Master Plan web page, you will see things like this. You have the essential operational change and a given solution for that essential operational phase. And these lines over here means the blue uh, the blue um, squares means that the uh, solution is in deployment. So this would be, for example, this one, integrated surface management. This one started last year in 2020 and will finish in 2027. And the light blue means that this solution is providing benefits to ATM. So it's this one is it started in 2020 and it's expected that will be that will bring benefits as soon as 2022 so all the solutions in CSR, well or not all of them those that are not mature enough though do not have this kind of implementation plan but solutions that are mature and that are in the lines towards development Toward deployment, sorry, have this kind of um, schedules. And this is an, an example for mature solutions, and these are examples for solutions that are approaching maturity. For example, something that we talked earlier, the, the virtual cent, uh, center concept, which was the equivalent of the, of the uh, remote towers, but for en route services. This will be uh, this project will start its deployment in 2022 and it's expected to finish in 2032 and it's expected to give to start giving benefits in 2024 and that in 2032 they will have um, they, will, uh, they will have achieved uh, the full um, uh, the full concept and all the benefits are available for ATM. So this is what the, the deployment of different solutions look like. And, and that's it. Uh, that's all for, for this uh, subject. In here you have the bibliography I've, I've been using and again, some online resources. And now, and now, uh, and now I want to talk to you about the homework one. But first, I would like to hear if uh, your thoughts about about this, do you think that this is our vision 
um, the deployment the deployment um, milestones will be achievable or not. So what do you think? Well, uh, it's a hard question. Yeah, I want to know what, what your opinions are after hearing all of this. I mean, yes, it's probably achievable, but they will have to work like really hard to make it happen, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> We will see, I guess. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, personally, I think that it's a lot, it's very ambitious, especially because they are devising all this ideal, an utopic ATM. I mean, of course, they will have, we will have improvements, but I think it's very ambitious. I think this line will be, I don't know, over here, I don't know. Let's see what the future brings.